and she hasn't been at home either, and she's not certainly not here. I mean, I'm she's borderline that I can't send her home right now uh, because of her both her level of consciousness and her responsiveness. But I mean, she has a mild, mildly impaired level of consciousness as well. <clears throat> Well, okay, but let's say that we do, and she does, then what? <laughs> well, well, it's not really the imaging. Right? Uh, so first of all, we can, but then I would also argue that what if she doesn't respond? Would that mean she's not a good sound candidate? I mean, only if it was NP, well, um, we can certainly tap her. She's here, and you know we can we can tap her. But, um, I think when you see her, you'll you'll see it's not her. I mean, she looks postictal, but she's been po she looked the same way for three days, and so the you know that obviously is not right. And when I so when I asked the family again, I look I re looked at the scan. I agree, it's not huge, but I mean the left ventricular system that the, the the temporal horn on the, excuse me, on the, yeah, on the left side is much larger. The occipital pole is expanded. So I don't doubt that her ventricles are larger. No. Yeah, but. I don't think so. Sure. Um, we, can, uh, we can try a large volume tap. We have no problem with that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. That's fine. Okay. Uh, well, I don't mind. No, geez, not at all. Um, we uh, we don't mind at all. Okay. Okay, very good. There's no rush. Okay, really. Bye bye. Hello, everybody. Um, we have a patient with uh, communicating hydrocephalus that we're going to want to be able to do a sort of pre and post assessment, mm -hmm. pre and post tap. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could just help our team organize that. On the invasion? Okay, okay. Great. Okay. I don't know if we're recording live here, if we are, hello to the internet um, while we're taking care of patients and no names. So, hi, um, do, who's over at St. Chris? Anybody that needs to, so is, you wanna just, he's on. Okay, good, all right. And then, hello over there at St. Chris. All right, uh, today is, I guess, the fourth in the series, the third uh, downstream or second. What did we do, the second nucleotides last week? So I guess so. So this is the second downstream uh, uh, group of signals uh, based on G proteins. And um, here's our outline for today. It's a complex outline. Uh, this is a very peculiar signaling system. What makes it peculiar is that with a single action, a molecule is cleaved into two signaling uh, uh, chemicals, and they are they're synergistic to one another, but they're independent of one another. And I, I'm not sure I can think of another uh, system. Well, the G protein itself, which can uh, dissociate into the alpha and the beta gamma pair, uh, so that that's a that is a good example um, where. A single receptor activation generates two completely uh, 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 total uh, separate pathways. And here you're gonna see the same thing. We're gonna start with uh, the, we're, what we're gonna be talking about are the inositol phospholipids. And then we're gonna see that through the action of phospholipase C, we generate um, inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol. And both of them are, um, are, are very potent uh, intracellular signals which uh, are the downstream effects of a external signal. <clears throat> myelinositol, so we start with myelinositol. There's enough myelinositol in the brain that it's one of the peaks on uh, uh, MR spectroscopy, right? So you have a myelinositol peak. That's how much of this there is in the brain. 
It's a significant amount. This diagram is up here uh, just to show you that we are able to phosphorylate. If you look, look here at the myonositol molecule, so we're going to have numbers, and, and it isn't important to know precisely where they are, but they go one through six, and we'll look at this more in a minute. And you can phosphorylate any combination of these that you want, and each phosphorylation pattern is a different messenger, okay? Phosphate groups are, are, are big, charged, divalent ions, right? So this is a huge... Uh, uh, change in the configuration of any molecule that comes in contact with this character. And, and these are large, uh, uh, highly energetic signals. And we'll look at that question in a minute. There's uh, millimolar concentrations here. You look at this, 20 millimolar. That's a whole lot. That's what I'm saying. You can see it on MR spectroscopy. It can be a precursor for other molecules. It is, there's enough of it that it has actually uh, has an osmolar uh, um, force of its own. Um, it, with these phosphate groups, um, they're high energy, so you can use it for energy storage. And our purpose today is to look at it as a messenger. Um, this is really where we start, uh, uh, and that is with what are called phosphoinositides. All right? um, we start, so obviously it looks like a phospholipid molecule, and you have an inositol head group. We actually talked about this molecule uh, briefly when we were looking at uh, membrane lipids. This is a very specific molecule though. <clears throat> it has the glycerol back, uh, backbone. It is a uh, phospholipid, all right, with these carbonyl group here. And then the two chains are not random or statistical. They are specific, okay? There's, these are the only chains that are used. You have an 18-0, which is stearic acid, 18 carbon, uh, completely saturated. And then you have the arachidonic acid, which is a 20 carbon uh, uh, lipid molecule with uh, con four conjugated uh, bonds, all right? The head group is inositol with varying phosphorylation. And so we're gonna talk about the, we're just gonna use numbering systems. And if you just look at this right now, here are the three, four, and five positions. So the four is the power of its connection to the um, acyl chains. Here's a, an example of what it looks like, okay? So uh, this is the inositol, is in the, what's usually referred to as a chair configuration. For some reason, it's become a reason that I don't really know. Um, uh, in this particular literature, it's referenced to a turtle. Um, okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, so it's a turtle. It's right arm is the one that has the phospholipid group, okay? Um, you synthesize this, first of all, from glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, that's easily converted to inositol 3-phosphate. You then the dephosphorylate the inositol. That's myo-inositol. You then take the myo-inositol and stick it on a, a, a cytidine-activated diacylglycerol to make phosphatidyl inositol, the molecule that we're starting with as a signal. Then you can phosphorylate the head group of the inositol all you want. And like I say here, this is each of these phosphate groups, sticking a phosphate on a hydrocarbon is tremendously expensive energetically. And so you don't want to be just cycling this easily. So they're going to be reused. You don't want to do this often. And, this, and there's a lot of it in there. Here's just briefly in skeleton form. Here's the glucose 6-phosphate with the oxygen in the ring. Inositol does not have an oxygen in the ring. It has a phosphate group sticking off here after its synthetic step. You then cleave off that phosphate group or stick it on. So cleave off the phosphate group and then rephosphorylate it on a different oxygen. And, and that's your phosphatidyl inositol. So very simple. There are, um, you use kinases to put phosphates on. You, take, you use phosphatases to take uh, phosphate groups off. So this is going to be a highly organized, regulated system. It's a highly specific system. You can use this basic form, depending on where you put the phosphate, for very, very different purposes, depending on, again, on the phosphorylation. The most standard, um, so they're called PIPs. We're going to get into these abbreviations, but this is a, a phosphoinositol phosphate. Let me just call it a PIP. So these, the, the major ones, quantitatively major, 
uh, are uh, with the phosphate group, either the phosphatidyl inositol itself, or with a phosphate on the four group, that was para, or on the four five position, which this is the probably the major signal, this phosphoinositol four five diphosphate. Okay. It's easier just to picture this. And 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 I don't I think you just want to keep in mind that this is a phosphoinositol with two phosphate groups, one at the four and one at the five position. Um, you can use a phosphatase, all right, to take the five prime off if you want. But there's just dozens of ways that you can do this. And the minor pips are a three. So with the phosphate group on the three. Yeah, if you guys are, um, that's fine if you want to see this then. So uh, the minor pips uh, are a three prime rather than four or five prime. And they're totally different. They do totally different things in the cell. And we'll come back to all of this. This complex diagram just uh, on the left side, I would say, all I want you to realize is that you can interconvert all of these. You can make them, break them, do whatever you want. The right target is, I think, um, worth looking at because now you start with the 4-5 um, uh, phosphatidyl inositol, all right? And then you're going to cleave it. That's phospholipase C. We're going to look at that in a second. And you get diacylglycerol and the triphosphoinositol. These are your two key signaling molecules. And then you can resynthesize them. <clears throat> The enzyme that degrades, not that degrades, the enzyme that is activated and generates the, uh, the pair. So this is the, you start again with the phosphoinositol, 4,5-diphosphate, and you generate the triphosphoinositol or inositol triphosphate, which is abbreviated as IP3 from now on, and the diacylglycerol. IP3, so now let's, so this has all been like, I can't even follow this, all right? But, but the key here is that from a single molecule, we're gonna generate two messengers. And the soluble phosphorylated uh, messenger, the inositol, is gonna go to the endoplasmic reticulum and it's gonna release the calcium that's stored in the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's gonna flood the cell with calcium. You're gonna take it at the level that this thing is triggered, your concentrations in the cell, are between 10 to the minus six and 10 to the minus seventh. And after it's loose, after the IP3 is out in the cytoplasm, the calcium concentrations are gonna to rise toward a millimolar range. So they're gonna jump two to three orders of magnitude in response to this neurotransmitter, this internal signal. This is major, okay, this is the big deal, all right? Then the diacylglycerol, which is the lipid portion of, and again, you have a very specific a lipid pair of, of stearic acid and arachidonic acid, okay? So this is a very specific molecule. This is, not just, this is not just a structural phospholipid here. This very specific lipid molecule is then going to float in the plane of the membrane, in the monolayer of the membrane, all right? And it's going to activate protein kinase C. And we're gonna look at how that happens. And that is going to have numerous downstream effects. Protein kinase C is obviously going to phosphorylate and other proteins and enzymes, and it's we'll get to it. Um, there are innumerable pathways. Again, this is major. This is this is not some little trivial thing that we're talking about. It's complicated, and I'm sorry, but this is this is not a minor signaling pathway. This is major, and so um, we talked about all these. Uh, um, uh, neurotransmitters and peptides that, or that act through G proteins. They act through G proteins because the G protein activates the phospholipase C, all right? And the phospholipase C splits the, the PIP molecule and releases massive amounts of calcium into the cell and phosphorylates key proteins. And that's where the signal becomes. All of them are activated through G proteins. This is a nice cartoon. So let's let's get away from words here and look at some pictures. Here's your traditional G protein. Here's your uh, 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 there's your G protein re uh, associated receptor, right? Here's the G protein down here, the GQ, which is the uh, the equivalent of the alpha subunit. So light or whatever it is that the G protein receptor is activated by. Uh, we, you know, activates, acts on in its, in its usual GTPase-dependent manner, 
um, it activates uh, this, uh, the G protein, the GQ, again, the alpha subunit goes and activates phospholipase C, which acts on the phosphoinositol diphosphate lipid molecule, phosphoinositide, and releases both an IP3 and a DAG, which we'll look at in another slide. The IP3 then loose in the cytoplasm, uh, has its own receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum. We'll look at this in a minute. And that's a calcium channel. And when it interacts with that calcium channel, the calcium channel just opens wide and calcium floods the cell. At that level, calcium does all of the things that calcium can do, including in persistent and highly elevated levels, kill the cell if necessary. Okay, so this is the beginning of your apoptosis pathway right there, persistent elevation of calcium, which can also come from the mitochondria as well as from the endoplasmic reticulum when it's excessive. Let's look at phospholipase C, this very uh, the molecule that's at the, at the interface, if you will, between the G protein and these two other signals. So how do we generate these two? So first of all, phospholipase C has an auto-inhibitory segment that's very cool. I'm going to show you some pictures. But basically, it has its own, um, it's often referred to as a, um, a almost like a pseudo-substrate. It sits there as a piece of itself that inhibits itself. It then has, and I, I don't want to get into too much detail, but I'm just going to say these because you're going to hear these terms. It has a plextrin homology domain. I'll show you. Um, that become that allows the phospholipase C to become tethered to the plasma membrane via a direct interaction with the phosphoinositide molecule. So phospholipase C is not a membrane-bound protein in the beginning. It's off near the near the plasma membrane, but not in it or even attached to it until um, uh, until the system gets activated, and then the uh, the phospholipase C um, interacts with the phosphoinositide molecule. So not only is the phosphoinositide molecule gonna be split by the phospholipase C, but the phosphoinositide molecule, it would brings the phospholipase C to the membrane. This is a very um, attractive system to me chemically. Um, all of the phospholipase C isoforms, and I think we said there are like 15 of them, there's a huge number of different isoforms, but they all have an EF hand, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. That is a calcium binding domain. So this system, which is going to flood the cell with calcium, is itself activated by calcium. All of this, uh, okay? And again, this is just what I said before here at the bottom. Here's a plextrin homology domain. Um, you look at it and go, um, okay, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with that. And the point though is that this plexin homology domain is intended, its purpose is to interact with phosphoinositide. That's all. That's what a plexin homology domain does. It allows the protein to interact with the phosphoinositide molecule, period. The EF hand domain, I've already said, so it, it gets its name from this picture. It's a, out, a pair of alpha helices that look like that to somebody. Uh, but the point is, is that here in the crux of the hand, of the, in the palm, is a calcium. So the EF hand domain, which you'll see in lots of different proteins, is a calcium binding domain. So you have a domain on phospholipase C that binds to the phosphoinositide, and you have a domain that's the plexin homology, and you have an EF hand that's job is to complex with calcium. And when those two things happen, then the phospholipase C is going to be activated, okay? Calcium is obligatory. So although its action is to flood the cell with calcium, it won't activate unless the calcium reaches a certain level. So if you think about how that you may remember back to your physiology activation from last year is you, you trickle in a little bit of calcium and then that little bit of calcium, you bring it from 10 to the minus seventh to almost 10 to the minus sixth. So a small increase in calcium, but that activates, that enables a whole set of systems to become active that then uh, generates the uh, huge calcium influx, okay? You have different sorts of ways of recruiting phospholipase C. Um, there's a, it has its own intrinsic kinase activity, all right? That when it interacts with sulfhydryl groups, it's, it, it activates itself. 
okay? You can do ligand binding to the G protein. This is what we've been talking about. This is a pertussis toxis, pertussis toxis insensitive. And then there is a separate ligand which activates it through a pertussis sensitive. So this is where pertussis toxin works, is on phospholipase C. This is three different ways of activating it. And you just cartoon format for a intrinsic interaction that the phospholipase has as it's drawn to the phosphoinositides, it interacts with sulfhydro groups, or you can use receptor binding uh, through a, um, uh, like I said, pertussis toxin insensitive or a pertussis toxin sensitive uh, method with using the beta gamma pair. Different mechanisms. And I think that's all you wanna know right now is that there are different mechanisms, one of which is uh, pertussis toxin sensitive. There are different ways of doing this. And here, this whole slide is simply about that very recently, uh, you know, we had, so go back to our G protein and talk for a second. You remember there were these receptor activated G proteins. Those were the ones that are the main body. But then there were these older, small G proteins. Right? They were the older, soluble, small G proteins. We saw them in archaea and that sort of thing. There, so not surprisingly, um, uh, it has recently been found that there are small RAS-like uh, G proteins uh, that are circulating in the cytoplasm, and they also can interact with phospholipase C, uh, separate from the membrane, okay? These characters have extreme sensitivity to calcium. This is a calcium system. This is a feed-forward system for calcium, all right? Um, now, when you um, uh, then have the, uh, so we want to look at the, the, this calcium release by IP3, all right? Um, it interacts, so IP3 interacts with a very specific glycoprotein uh, to cause release of the calcium from the ER stores, all right? You see this most of all in the cerebellum. So that means it's fairly, this whole system is relatively modern in terms of phylogeny. The IP3 uh, receptor is a homotetramer four subunits. Each of them has three domains or for binding and regulation, and then the calcium spanning, uh, the membrane spanning that makes the channel. So this slide shows you that. Here's your six uh, domains, uh, the transmembrane domains. Um, this is what's going to form the calcium floor. And this is a lot like we've seen in other uh, systems that we talked about very recently. You have an IP3 binding region. You can also phosphorylate it through activation by uh, uh, ATP and the small um, G proteins. Uh, so of course the main effect of the IP3 then is going to be result in this huge amount of calcium in the system. Uh, the signal amplifies itself, it sets up oscillations within the cell, all right? And um, basically that's how I would think about IP3. This is a system, let's, let's say it again, G protein receptor, G protein, the GQ subunit, which is the equivalent of the G alpha subunit, um, interacts with phospholipase C. Phospholipase C interacts with phosphoinositide. It cleaves the phosphoinositide into IP3 and diacylglycerol. The IP3, which is the only part of this that we've looked at so far, is then going to cause a massive release of calcium into the cell. That's it. And then there are membrane-bound phosphatases, and you take that, uh, that IP3, and as soon as you cleave off the 5, it's inactive. And that's the end of the signal. So that's all there is. It's a 5' prime and uh, phosphatase. Um, you could also, not only could you cleave off the 5, but if you wanted to, you could take a kinase and put a 3 on, so then you'd have 3, 4, 1, 3, 4, 5 inositol. That's inactive. So you can inactivate it either by taking the five prime off or by adding a three prime. And this may be part, part of lithium's actions is to um, 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 act, activate that three prime kinase. Okay, so let's just stop for a second and take a breath. All right, you all right? Everybody good? In a way it's simple, right? There are a lot of steps, but the net result of this system is fairly simple. You got a lot of calcium in the cell, in the cytoplasm when you're done. Affects everything. So you know, it's just you have 
whole systems downstream, uh, uh, other signaling systems, um, intracellular signaling uh, that are in, including at the nuclear level that are huge. And it's hard to think of any systems in, this, in a neuron that are not activated by this much calcium. So then let's look at the other part of the signal here, which is diacylglycerol. It's, um, it doesn't have more steps, but, but its downstream effects are, are much more diverse. So diacylglycerol is the glycerol backbone with the stearic acid and the arachidonic acid. That got cleaved also by, is generated in the same step as the IP3. It's simultaneously generated. So I just, I, I feel like that's almost, you got to think about it. I mean, it's just worth stopping for a second and saying, why would you do that? What is the point of taking a single molecule and splitting it with a single enzyme? And then, okay, I can get, I get it. It has different isoforms, but no matter what the isoform, the isoform is just going to be the specificity of what triggers the phospholipase C. Once the phospholipase C does its thing, and the only thing that it does is to cleave the phosphoinositide. So once it does it, you simultaneously generate two signaling molecules. So why would you do this? Why would you simultaneously generate two signaling molecules? I mean, just, just think about the logic of it for a second. Why, what, why do that? What does it say? Yeah, so, so number one, uh, you would, I think, somehow hope and expect that they must act in a coordinated manner, right? It would be weird if they had nothing to do with one another at all. That would be bizarre that you would cause somehow both systems to trigger at the same time. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. I meant to trigger this one. And, and the other one gets activated too, and they're not related. And that, that doesn't really make much sense. So then you want to say, well, they, they must, at least in some settings, act synergistically to one another. I mean, I think that's one of the things. If you're going to generate both of them, then they must activate different systems. If they activated the same one identical system, then what's the point of two signaling molecules? So they must act on different systems. The systems must be synergistic in some setting. And yet, like Pavana is saying, you must want to be able to regulate them. They must not be identical. They can't, they, no point if they're identical. So they must do somehow different things, or maybe synergistic, but different. And by splitting them, you can tune the system in different ways by different signals. You could make them responsive to the, the regulatory steps of the IP3 or the DAG might respond to different regulatory stimuli might work. So it has to be something like that in a logical way. Otherwise, nature isn't stupid. Nature doesn't, doesn't create two signaling molecules for no reason. Okay, it doesn't, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it has no reason to go through the machinery to, to generate that. There's something going on. The, um, the protein kinase C is an interesting molecule. So I just want to look a little bit at the protein kinase C with you. Um, basically, it, uh, and it, this is, I'm not the only one to say this, in a lot of ways, it's like a toilet bowl. It's a toilet bowl, sort of like. It's, it's a bowl, okay, that is the catalytic domain. And it has a hatch. And when the hatch is down over the toilet bowl, the, the enzyme is, won't work. And when you open the hatch, then it works. And in between the hatch and the toilet bowl, actually, is a what's called a pseudo substrate, which is reminded me, uh, Lakshmi, when you showed me the picture this morning of that thing, the, the vitreous artery just sort of floating there. That's what this thing is like. There's a pseudo substrate that hangs on the hatch. And when you oh, when when it's when the hatch is closed, the pseudo substrate occupies the catalytic site of protein kinase C. Okay, and by occupying that site, obviously it ensures because it's not a substrate; it's a pseudo substrate that fits in the catalytic site, so it inhibits it. So this is a very firmly inhibited system. But when you open the hatch, okay, the pseudo substrate is pulled out of the catalytic site. And now the catalytic site is ready to go. Okay, that's how protein kinase C works. 
Um, the, the hatch is open by diacylglycerol. So when the diacylglycerol binds to the protein kinase C, that opens the hatch, all right? Um, most of the forms of protein kinase C are calcium sensitive, but recently there have been some discovered that are actually not calcium sensitive. So there you go. We were looking for some downstream Y, two different systems. There's one of them that isn't even sensitive to calcium. Um, nice cartoon. I like these uh, pair of cartoons. Here's your extracellular signal. Here's your G protein coupled receptor. You know, this is where we're starting, guys. We activate the G alpha Q. That activates the phospholipase C. The PIP2 becomes IP3 and releases calcium. We've been talking about that. Now, here we go on the other side. Here goes the DAGs. Of course, there's no flip-flop, right? So it stays on the intracellular leaflet of the bilayer. Uh, it encounters a protein kinase C. It opens the hatch, okay? The most protein kinase Cs are calcium sensitive. The calcium has been released by, from the endoplasmic reticulum by the IP3, and the system is now ready to go, all right? And so protein kinase C now becomes active. Notice that they draw again, they draw the protein kinase C is the protein, uh, the phospholipase C is, is at least close to the membrane. Protein kinase C can be anywhere in the cytoplasm and is brought to the surface. And I'm gonna return to that idea of brought to and activated. We're gonna see some nice membrane chemistry. Here's the G protein coupled receptor, IP3, calcium. Calcium interacts with the regulatory subunit on the, here's the protein kinase C uh, latch, okay? And then once it active, this is a kinase, so it's going to phosphorylate other proteins. That's what it is, it's a kinase, protein kinase C. Another cartoon, I like this cartoon. This is the life cycle, I call it, of the, I'm not sure how to get rid of that, but the life cycle of a protein kinase C molecule. So here it is. Um, it hasn't been, uh, so it, it basically this is its, um, it moves from an unprimed state near the membrane to floating in the cytoplasm, primed and ready to go. Um, uh, with the um, uh, activation of phospholipase C, it is drawn to the plasma membrane to, active, to interact with um, the uh, uh, diphospho, the phosphoinositide. Uh, this then generates diacylglycerol as well as the IP3. The diacylglycerol then um, activates, opens the hatch. Here's the pseudo substrate hanging out, okay, and the enzyme is active. You uh, take a phosphatase and now you uh, inactivate the enzyme, okay, and same sort of thing uh, in, internally. Protein kinase C maturation. Um, uh, so it has this autoinhibitory pseudo substrate. You remove that upon activation with isoglycerol. It then has, watch this, okay? It has a uh, phosphoinositol dependent kinase, which phosphorylates a threonine residue in its own activation loop. This is an autophosphorylation. So it, it phosphorylates itself on a threonine. We're, we're gonna have downstream signaling. We're gonna be talking about tyrosine kinases and threonine kinases. So these get quite specific. So this is a threonine kinase. This then uh, autophosphorylates the C-terminus, okay, uh, which is required for the catalytic activity. The phosphorylated enzyme is then released into the cytoplasm. All right. And the pseudo substrate is, uh, um, will then remain bound uh, in and inhibit the protein kinase C until the diacylglycerol binds again to the molecule. Diacylglycerol is membrane bound, so the protein kinase C has to be brought to the uh, inner bilayer, uh, inner leaflet of the bilayer. And again, uh, in a little bit more detail, here it is uh, floating in a uh, relatively inactive step. You then, uh, an agonist gets the receptor, activates phospholipase C. Now you have the diacylglycerol floating. That allows the kinase to interact at the plasma membrane. It then, with the interaction of the, of the diacylglycerol, the hatch is open. The pseudo substrate is removed from the catalytic site. It does its thing. It phosphorylates itself and other threonines all over the place. And then eventually you dephosphorylate it. And that's the end of the signal. 
and it will be returned to its uh, self-inhibited state. The latch will close and it will re-inhibit itself in the absence of the diacylglycerol. Um, I just like this cartoon because it shows you the hatch opening. That's all. All right. Through its actions, the phosphokinase C, the, excuse me, the protein kinase C phosphorylates typically either a serine or a threonine on its target protein, or also itself, but, but on its target protein. These, these sites that it can uh, phosphorylate are hugely diverse. Uh, these are just some examples. Um, a uh, microtubule associated protein kinase, a vitamin D3 receptor, a calpane, uh, epidermal growth factors. So this is going to be all over the place, right? Which starts to get to the question of, well, if I start releasing protein kinase C and it phosphorylates all these, am I going to activate all of these systems at once? So that's a question that you have to deal with. The protein kinase C activity um, is, as it says, notoriously long lasting, okay? And it long, uh, it's activated by this wave of calcium that is released by the IP3. But just because the calcium, when the calcium is taken, the IP3 is, is either degraded by a five prime phosphatase or a three prime kinase. But either one, when the calcium signal ends and the calcium is taken back up into the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria, and the concentration goes back down to 10 to the minus seventh, the protein kinase C does not turn off. It has calcium bound to it now. It's been active and its lifetime will, it'll continue to be active until we saw the unique protein kinase C phosphatases. That's our last talk. The fifth talk of the series is on phosphatases. Regulating the turning off the signal is, in, 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 when you look at diversity, almost looks more important than turning on the system. Couple cartoons, uh, smaller cartoons means less detail that you have to think about, right? Uh, uh, the point of this cartoon is to just show you that it also interacts with um, transcription factors. And so the protein kinase C uh, will uh, influence the, um, actually acts through a, uh, by activating uh, some histone regulatory proteins and now the histone uh, acylases, and you end up with an active uh, gene product. So, so definitely uh, this is uh, associated with gene activation. Um, downstream uh, it could be um, just a series of proteins, I guess I would put on here and here, this for the degradation of phosphatases. And I just like this cartoon because this cartoon shows you the protein kinase C activating the amber receptor and leading to your LTD, you know, so uh, long-term depolarization, activating microtubule associated proteins, um, gap protein, mark protein. So all sorts of different things are, are activated by the protein kinase C. And, and I'll say again, when you look at this cartoon, you go, does it do this to everybody all at once? I mean, you know, what, what is, that's doesn't seem a lot of activity, a very diverse system. They all, why doesn't the cell just go into spasm or something weird? So the, one of the keys here is that there's, despite the fact that you have all these, that there's very little overlap of these substrates for all of the protein, K, uh, protein kinase C uh, isoforms, all right? So now the, the answer is no. Although the cartoons would lead you to believe that once active, it has lots of activities. The point is, is that actually that cartoon is misleading because there really are very diverse protein kinase Cs, all right? Um, and they are regulated. The, the location of these different isoforms is extremely tightly controlled through intracellular localization. So I've, we made this point uh, last week when we were talking about uh, local concentrations of cyclic AMP and GMP. And we were saying that there were gradients, a uh, concentration gradients of, of uh, cyclic AMP. So this is another way so, uh, in which the cell, a single cell, maintains heterogeneity within its own domains. And I keep using as a simple example, the dendritic spine and the dendrite. The dendritic spine is, is an appendage of the dendrite but they behave differently to the, even to the same neurotransmitter. 
So there has to be some way of creating these spatial gradients. We talked about a spatial gradient for cyclic AMP because the um, protein kinase A was anchored and maintained in a certain location in the cell. The protein kinase C not only is anchored and brought into a, a particular part of the cell, but it has different enzymes, uh, different isozymes that are brought into different parts of the cell. All right? And um, this makes these tremendously, again, uh, future uh, uh, pharmacology uh, needs to be able to make use of this sort of thing when we get uh, much more specific. And you could also picture that inborn errors of metabolism can affect different protein kinases, lead to all sorts of CNS problems, including, uh, you know, um, mental retardation, epilepsy. I mean, these are, these are definitely... Uh, you have no doubt that there are going to be uh, genetic um, mutations that affect these. There's no reason not to. Um, even different alleles are going to make some more sensitive or less sensitive, which are going to make some people smarter or less smart. Or if it's too much, then maybe they get a little psychotic or they... All these things that, that uh, simply put that we don't understand. But this diversity is, is, is there for a reason, okay? That much we do understand that there's a reason for this diversity. We're almost done. So um, uh, I just want to uh, um, you know, take, a, take a step back with the protein kinase C signaling looked at as a whole. Um, most activators of protein kinase C are G protein coupled receptors, the serotonin, muscarinic, metabotropic glutamate. So shortly, you know, I mean, in January, you're gonna start talking about these. And, and I think that all of this will start these systems that they utilize Will, will come into focus more. Uh, the diacylglycerol. So it's terminated actually by taking the, um, uh, that which a form of phosphatidic acid and phosphorylating it, and that's the end of the DAG signal. They often act in concert through uh, calcium. Um, and then you're also going to see, as you read your pharmacology chapters, and we're, we're, we've been doing chemistry, not quite pharmacology, but, but soon we're gonna do pharmacology. And you will see what are known as four bowl esters. Four bowl esters are uh, stable uh, uh, molecules that can penetrate the cell and they mimic diacylglycerol. So, if you want to study the effects of diacylglycerol, you use a four bowl ester, okay? And because they enter the cell and they're not degraded, so it's a permanent activation. The last level of complexity of this, and I'm sorry, but there's just one more. This is just how rich the system is, is that, remember this, the phosphoinositol phosphates, that although they activate protein kinase C, all right, the, uh, through, although they are substrates for phospholipase C, even without being a substrate, just being there, they are, they are themselves signaling molecules. So the substrate, of phospholipase C, even without activation by the phospholipase C cleavage into the two signals is by itself a signaling molecule. And I don't want to get into it. I mean, this is just, it gets you you're going, this is too much, demasiado. This is, this is just way over the top here. I didn't make this system, right? This is just, but this is, you know, a glorious system of the central nervous system. I mean, this signal exists elsewhere, but the CNS uses it to be extreme, okay? So the, or this, is the, this is the one that is the substrate for phospholipase C. Uh -huh. And this one is not, it's three, four, five, uh, um, okay? But these specifically interact with protein molecules and they act to as anchors basically. So they recruit protein molecules to the surface. So if the cell synthesizes a bunch of these, then it's going to bring certain proteins who have an affinity for this molecule or this molecule, it's gonna bring those proteins to the surface. Some of them may be enzymes, some of them may not, okay? And then in addition, okay, and I hope you appreciate this because we talked several times about the need to construct rafts, that when, when membrane-bound proteins act, they usually create a factory, okay? You don't just have the enzyme sitting there but it recruits a host of enzymes. So think for a second, okay, this is where we're gonna go with this in a second. Think about the synapse, all right? Think about the vesicle fusion. Go back to the lecture on vesicle fusion. 
Remember all that complex of proteins which we had with synaptotagmin and remember all those guys and, and they all had to be assembled right where the vesicle was fusing, all right? The mechanism for assembling those involves these phosphoinositides. The phosphoinositides are what attract these proteins which are going to result in the fusion of the vesicle, okay? They're going to, those proteins are, they are activated and brought to the surface and made ready for vesicle fusion by the presence of the phosphoinositides. So this goes back to that original signal. They bring them together to create an assemblage, okay? And so here you are. This is the most important factor in exocytosis of neurosecretory granules is not the phospholipase C, but simply the phosphoinositide itself, okay? And it brings together a bunch of calcium activated proteins. Remember the synaptotagmin, which was the calcium sens uh, uh, sensitizer. If you remember one of the proteins, and I don't, I don't remember which, I don't remember which synapto something was, it, act, it had to, requ it required calcium for activation, but it wasn't itself calcium sensitive, okay? So you had to bring in the synaptotagmin, which made it calcium sensitive. It's the IP, I, the, these phosphoinositides are what bring these various proteins together so that they act in concert. They have to be assembled next to one another. They hold on to one another. They are brought together in an organized, um, uh, in an organized complex of proteins by the phosphoinositides. And then the same thing is true. If you remember those pretty clathrin protein uh, uh, pictures that we showed from the EM. So the clathrin, which removed the synaptic vesicle and recycled the synaptic vesicle in some cases, is also sensitive and created by the phosphoinositides. So the phosphoinositides are remarkably important for synaptic function. They both are necessary for vesicle fusion and for vesicle recycling. All right. So... And finally, um, they also interact with the cytoskeletal, the submembrane cytoskeletal system, which of course is the um, actin filaments, all right? And so the actin filaments are, um, uh, have other proteins which provide a binding to the phosphoinositide, uh, which allows the actin system to move these aggregate proteins together into an assemblage. Um, they also are responsible for uh, the uh, for CAM cell adhesion molecules and bringing different cell adhesion molecules, which also was the basis of the electrical synapse. Okay, all of this dependent on the phosphoinositides. And and again, in in case the in case this the importance of this system to signaling in the central nervous system isn't apparent. You also assemble your voltage gated potassium channels and your voltage gated calcium channels through the phosphoinositides. They are everywhere. These are, so, so we saw the phosphoinositide, cleave it, make an IP3, make diacylglycerol. IP3 releases calcium. Diacylglycerol activates protein kinase C. But the synthesize the phosphoinositide, phosphorylate the inositol in the way that you want and you aggregate proteins to for some function that you want to accomplish, all right? The three prime are also separate. They're, they're separate and they also are active in a totally separate signaling. And at this point, it's just sensory overload here. Um, but the three prime are just as complicated as the four five prime with their own regulation of, of kinases that make them and phosphatases that degrade them. Everything under regulation. And again, you go, I mean, Again, not trivial systems. Here's your apoptosis pathway is activated through the five prime. Different protein uh, kinases that interact. The system is synucleinopathies or you know, probably partly a response to all of this stuff. It just goes on and on, okay? So summarizing, um, the phosphoinositides have diverse function. Like I said, they're a substrate for phospholipase C, which generates two signals. They are also non-enzymatically active as binding sites for membrane proteins. And the three-prime system is both involved in development, but also involved in apoptosis. And so this is going to be a system that will appear 
Uh, this will be during in, in utero. This will be a much more active system in the adult, very little, not until you need it to commit sepulchre. And we will return to this as we start to look at interactions because we haven't dealt with phosphatases at all, okay? And we still have to look at, um, at other things, okay? This is, this is sort of where I am right now with this thing. It's, it's like, and, and one more time, let's just say it before we stop, okay? All of this is downstream intracellular signaling because of activation of a G protein coupled receptor. That's the trigger is the G protein coupled receptor. Okay, All right, that's it. Thank you, goodbye in the world of internet and pediatric neurology.